There are a few crucial decisions that have, ca have happened in the history of the church that have shaped the very culture, the very nature of what it means to be church. A few of the biggest ones, well, one of the first was in, in Acts 15, when the first, at the first council of the church, it was decided that you didn't have to be Jewish to become a follower of Jesus. And so because of that decision, none of us had to become Jewish before we followed Jesus. It was that that, that decision, decision still shapes us today. Another such important decision <clears throat> would be, for example, in the 16th century. At that point, the only singing done in church was done by professional choirs. And Martin Luther, as he started his, his Reformation, uh, he started protesting. He said that the people should sing. And, and the reason that we sing today in, in church was because Martin Luther, back then, decided we should sing in church. And that, again, shapes how we worship today. I couldn't imagine having worship, having church, without singing together. And it is rooted in what Martin Luther, that, that decision back then. But there's another decision that, that I want to share with you today. And this decision, you might have heard of the Acts, you, you might have heard of the one with Martin Luther, but this one ends up being lost to history for many of us. And, and this is a, the history of a decision made in the 8th century in Constantinople. And so we're going to look at that today because I think, in, oddly enough, in 8th century Constantinople, we might find something very helpful for how we celebrate Christmas in 2013. Well, 8th century Constantinople, well, what's going on there? It is the continuation of the Roman Empire. We all know Rome falls, right? It is invaded by uh, Germans, Visigoths, different types of Goths, which modern Germans, who come out of the north and they invade down into the south and they, they sack Rome and Rome is destroyed and the Roman Empire falls, right? Eh, not exactly. The Western Roman Empire falls, but the Eastern Roman Empire continues, and it continues in, in what we would now call Turkey, in this, this area that is to the, the east of Italy, and it's this area that's between the Middle East and, and Europe. And in this, this continuation of the Roman Empire, the capital was Constantinople. It was uh, built by an emperor named Constantine, and he was just a bit self-centered, so he named the entire city after himself. And Constantinople continues, and it ends up being sort of the bastion of, of Christian learning and education. As, as Europe falls into the Dark Ages, uh, Constantinople and, and the Eastern Roman Empire, which ends up being called the Byzantine Empire, uh, continues, and it, that, that's the place where people continue to be educated and learn to read and, and stuff, all those important details. And, and so, in centuries after the fall of Rome, in the 8th century, one of the academic arguments among uh, the, the theologians of the Byzantine Empire uh, kind of gets to be a really big deal. It sort of breaks out of academia and it turns into a major issue for the culture. And, and here is, is the argument. Can Christians use images and worship? Can Christians use art and imagery in worship? It had been done since the earliest times when, when Christians worshipped in the catacombs, they would, because that was the only safe place they could worship, they would they would paint like fishes and baptisms and communion on the wall of where they worshipped. So there, there was use of images early on, and, and that had sort of been the, the tradition for, for centuries at this point. And, and what had developed was that art used in the worship of God was called icons. You might have heard that term before. Icons. An icon, an example of an icon is on the front of your bulletin. It's an icon of St. Nicholas, which seemed fitting for the season. But these icons would be the finest art that could be made, and it would be used in the worship of God. These images, that would, you would look at this image, and this image with this art would direct us, our eyes upward, towards God. And, and, and these images would be used devotionally, and they would be used to educate as well, because not everyone could read. But I could teach you the stories of the Bible if I could point at the images, the icons, and the churches. If, if you go look at old cathedrals in Europe, you could tell the story of all of the Bible by just going around the, the imagery of the stained glass. I mean, you could teach people based upon all the art that was there. And, and it was never really questioned that we should use 
all of this, this imagery. The idea was that God gives us our, our gifts and that's our talents and that's God's gift to us. And then what we do with those gifts, that, that's our gift to God. That we, what we do with those talents. And, and so we offer our finest to God, our finest art. And maybe the art got a little bit opulent at times, a little bit over the top, but that was kind of how it, how it worked until this 8th century debate happened in Constantinople. You see, in Constantinople, it wasn't just Christians who were in Constantinople. It stood between Christian Europe, and, and then there was a Jewish a chunk of people, and then there was the whole Middle East full of the developing Muslim, Islamic faith. And, and the Muslims and the Jews were, would trade with people in Constantinople. And they had the same Ten Commandments we do. And they would read that second commandment. And they would read how it says, You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or earth below. You shall not make an idol. And the, the Jewish and the Muslim folks would, would look at what the Christians were doing, making these big, vast, opulent icons, and would say, Huh, what? That looks a little bit like an idol to me. That looks a little bit much. The Christian understanding had been, as long as you're not like making a calf and bowing to it, it's not an idol. Well, these Jewish and Muslim folks were looking at it and saying, you might want to look at what you got again. And are you really following the second commandment? And admittedly, some of what they were doing was getting quite a bit uh, extravagant. In, in a church called the Hagia Sophia, Hagia, Holy, Sophia, Wisdom. Um, that's what Sophia is named after, Wisdom. And uh, Hagia Sophia, it's, it was the biggest church, period. It was the biggest church for centuries. It's one of the biggest churches that has ever been built. They put a piece of artwork up front. It, it, it was called an iconostasis. It's a type of artwork. And, and if we put a big piece of artwork up front, how, how big could it be? About, what, eight foot tall, maybe ten foot wide, right? The artwork they put at the front of the Hagia Sophia was a 49 foot tall piece of solid silver. And on that 49 foot tall piece of square, huge piece of solid silver was just jewels and, and artwork and, and just all these icons. And, and, and all the Jewish folks and Muslims could look at this 49 foot tall, I just can't imagine how big, how much silver that would be. Could we look at that and say, are you sure that's not an idol? Is that directing you up towards God? Or are you just worshiping that silver? A good point. And, and the Jews, Jewish folks and the Muslims could point to this story in Scripture. They could point to this snake on a stick and, and how at first, when, when people looked up to the snake on a stick, the bronze snake on a stick, they could say that it was, as people had a problem, they would look up to this bronze snake on a stick and they would, as they were looking up, they would then look up to God in faith and as they would look up, they would turn to God and they would find healing. But then this snake on a stick eventually, instead of being what directed people to God, it then became something that was worshipped by itself. People were making offerings of food to this snake that then got named. It was named Nahushtan at some point. And so it had to be destroyed because something that originally was an icon, something used to direct people to God, had become an idol. And, it had to, and so it was destroyed. And so this, this argument that uh, all of this artwork that was being used to worship God really wasn't being used to worship God. It, it was turning into idolatry. Seems like a pretty good argument, doesn't it? And, and so that was the argument that was being pu pushed around at that time. And so uh, some of the emperors of the day were convinced of this and they, they uh, submit, uh, pr promulgated decrees to destroy all the, the icons. And, and there was much arguing and debating about, well, could you make a, an image of Jesus and if it was only... Jesus' humanity that was in the painting, then that was a heresy because it couldn't portray his divinity and you couldn't show all of Jesus. The only way to really see Jesus is in communion because that's where you get all of Jesus. And all of these arguments were being kicked around and the people who liked icons were then making their counter arguments. They were arguing that God was the first one to make images were made in the image of God, right? Genesis 3. And that uh, God was the one who became human and so we can paint and we can make art about humanity and, and that uh, that would work. Why, why is this a problem? And so this begins a century of arguing over could you use art in, uh, in worship? And it becomes a very heated thing at one point as different emperors and empresses would support icons 
uh, creating icons or destroying icons. At, at one point, an emperor and an empress disagreed. The emperor wanted to destroy the icons and his wife wanted to keep them. And when the emperor found out who was supporting his wife, he, who was creating icons, he went and found that person and had his hands branded so he could no longer create icons. And, and so it got really, two Christians married were brand, uh, just, whew, they really got ugly. And so this happens from 726 until 843, and until under uh, Princess or uh, Empress Theodora, finally the idea was was sort of won the day that yes, art and worship it, it can become idolatrous, and, and maybe it need, shouldn't be quite as opulent, but we do need to use it because it helps us to worship God. And so the icons are restored. It works out well that it happened by 843 because not that long afterwards, a guy by the name of Vladimir the Great was one of the first rulers of Russia. And as the first ruler, one of the first rulers of Russia, he was being lobbied by all these religions saying, you should come and be, you, you look like you'd make a great Jew. Come and be Jewish. Or you should, come, you should become Muslim. Come be a good Muslim of us. And so the, this, uh, this guy, Vladimir the Great, one of the first rulers of, of this, this huge chunk of the earth that was called Russia, sends out these envoys to find out which religion should he follow. This is what he says. First, uh, he sends his envoys to uh, the Muslims of uh, the Muslim Bulgarians of the Volga. And the envoys report that uh, Islam was undesirable due to its taboo against alcoholic beverages and pork. And what Vladimir the Great said is, and I quote, drinking is the joy of all of the Rus the earliest name for the Russians. Drinking is the joy of all Rus. We cannot exist without that pleasure. And so, the Russians did not become Muslim because they wanted to drink. Okay, what was next? They looked over at uh, the Jewish envoys and, and they, he sat down with them and what he said, uh, he questioned them about their religion but he ultimately rejected it saying that their loss of Jerusalem was evidence that they had been abandoned by God. I don't agree with that logic, but you know that was what he was saying. He goes and he sends envoys to the, the, so the sort of the Western Christian churches of Germany, but the emissaries there they saw no beauty, and so then he sends envoys to the Hagia Sophia, to the churches of Constantinople, to this, these Eastern churches who have just put back all the icons, who have just you start have recommitted themselves to using the finest art that they can create. And what those envoys came back and told Vladimir was, we no longer knew whether we were in heaven or on earth. And when they were trying to describe the majesty of what they had seen, they did not, they, they did not know how to describe such beauty. Russia became Christian because of the beauty of the Hagia Sophia and of the icons and of the art of Constantinople. Amazing connection there, isn't it? And so if we go back to this eighth, the 8th century, it is one of the most important decisions for how, how we worship today, that we use art, that we continue to use art in the worship of God, knowing that it can be a little bit dangerous, and yes, there is a chance of idolatry, but we believe that such art, such symbols, when used well, point us towards God, who is the source of all good things. And what's that have to do with Christmas? Great question. Let me tell you about it. <laughs> the decorating has begun, hasn't it? We are about to be awash in more red and green than really, uh, I'm always amazed by how many places we can find to put red and green. The Christmas music is on the radio. We, we listen to it on the way back from Thanksgiving. Not on the way to Thanksgiving. You do need to draw the line somewhere. But all of these symbols, all of this art, all of this that's about to be around us, it, what I would submit to you is that we take all of this and we allow all of this to be icons to direct us back to God. This would be, a, and I think this is a, a good way to approach this month, to look at all these symbols and to name them and to proclaim, this is why we put them up. This is how they direct us back to God. For example, everyone's going to put up a tree. Is anyone, anyone have your tree up yet? Y'all are good. We're still trying to figure out how we're going to get ours. Uh, and, and you put up your tree, and it is probably bigger than this. But what type of tree is it? It's an evergreen, right? Why is it an evergreen? 
Because an evergreen is evergreen. It never dies. And we who follow Jesus also need not fear death, for on the other side of death is life. We never die. And so as you put up your, your evergreen, let it be an icon to remind you of eternal life. And the Christmas wreath, the Christmas wreath is closely related to wreaths. They have no beginning and no end. Same way, life following Jesus has no beginning and end. The colors of Christmas are, are what? Red and green? Actually, the color of this month is purple. Why is it purple? Because purple, this is the color of royalty. We're getting ready to celebrate the birth of a king. And so when you celebrate for Christmas, put something really big and purple out. If you don't have something big and purple, blame me. Go shopping. Go get something for yourself. Go get something big and purple. And, and we, we, we look towards the coming of St. Nicholas. And, and you know, you can look at St. Nicholas as just the guy who, who convinces us all to buy more toys. Or you can see St. Nicholas as St. Nicholas, the Bishop of Mira, who is the one who used his inherited wealth to give... Um, gifts to three sisters who needed dowries or else they would end up on the street. And so as you hang up your decorations on your evergreen, the, the golden balls, why do we hang golden balls? Because the three, three golden balls are the sign of Saint Nick because he gave three gifts of gold to the three sisters so that they would have a dowry. You know, you go through all, all of the signs and all the symbols and all the things that we put up for Christmas. The lights are the light of Christ. The, the gifts are given are, are, are because we are given the gift of Jesus at Christmas. We, we are given, we have all these symbols around us. And, and what I would say is that for those of us who might not get into the Christmas spirit so easily, reclaiming them as the icons to direct us to God might help us to do so. And for those of us who just can't wait for Christmas to come, this might be a way to help make sure that Christmas is focused on he who is the source of all, all good things, all good gifts. And so to, to reclaim all of the symbols of Christmas as icons to use in worship, I think is a good way to approach Christmas, this season coming upon us. And for those of us who are going to have children or grandchildren around, it, it, oh, who here is not going to see your grandchildren or children this Christmas, right? Everyone, you're going to see them at some point. Make sure to sit down with them in front of the tree and tell them, this is why we put up the evergreen. This is why we put up the golden balls. That's why I have that big purple thing on the table. Because these are the icons of Christmas. These are the things that direct us to worship the God who is the reason that we celebrate this, this holy day. And, and so go home this day. Play your favorite Christmas music. Put out something purple. Put up your, your Christmas tree, your golden balls. Put up your lights. And let them each be for you icons, directing you to focus on the God who is the source of all of these gifts. Amen.